and I, I, almost identical words to that. I'm sure they've changed slightly over the years, but that was the, in, in intent, and mm -hmm. it was so powerful. And I was ready to go, but I also could see that I maybe didn't have to go. So there was hope, and that hope was there for the first time since the original diagnosis. It mm -hmm. wasn't as if I'd been hoping all along. It was like I accepted the doctor's word. But when I moved into that place of surrender, in that place of hope, then my I was back in my body. And I'm laying there, my heartbeat is going like, like this, because they say that when you die and you're resuscitated, that your heart has to catch up the missed beats or something. Mm. I don't know. Um, but they, that's what they say. Anyway, my heart is pounding like crazy, and the first thing I think of is, I'm not going to tell anybody about this because <laughs> they will lock me up and throw away the key. <laughs> And of course, I've told thousands of people about it since. But I didn't know what a near-death experience was. I had no idea what mm. uh, was happening or why. It was just totally bizarre. And so when you were asked to be shown, is that what catapulted you into the next phase of your life? Was it the being shown aspect? Well, strange things started to happen then. Um, Five days after that, it was actually this time of year because my husband was home, he was a school teacher, and he was home for the winter vacation. So my niece, who usually looked after my kids and myself when he was working, wasn't there. Um, but what, what happened first, uh, actually on Good Friday, I became deathly ill. I was so sick. I. I always said, no which end to put on the toilet. <laughs> so if you want to cut that out, that's okay. Um, but um, I was deathly ill, and all I could um, do was drink a little sips of ginger ale, and I would throw that. So eventually I was down to water, and I was throwing up water. So I was just, and I thought, well, this is part that missed out, because before I had that near-death experience, I kept saying, you know, God, if I have to die, then hurry up and get this over with, because everybody's suffering. You know, if, if I died, then my husband could find a new wife to look after my kids. <laughs> Pragmatic. <laughs> so, when I became deathly ill five days after, then I thought that God had hurt my first prayer and hadn't hurt his second one. Oh, God. So I was sure I was going to die all day, every day, for five days. And, oh well, four days. And then on the fifth day, I woke up and I'd, I realized I'd had a really deep sleep. And I looked out the window and it was a beautiful spring day, much like we've had for the last couple of weeks. And we, uh, the windows were open, the bedroom windows were open. I could see the light dappling on some red maple tree and leaves outside the window. And I could hear my husband in the backyard playing with my kids. And my oldest daughter was um, um, just learning how to ride her bike without training wheels. So he had her on the soft grass to teach her how you know, instead of on the hard driveway. And I could hear them and I wanted so much to go see them. Um, but I realized I had to go to the bathroom first. So I called, uh, and of course they were making so much noise, and it was quite a little distance away. They didn't hear me, so I thought I'd better hurry up and get there somehow. And so I thought, I'm feeling so well, I think I can get out of bed and go by myself. And I did. I crawled along, held on to dressers and doorways, and I got into the bathroom. And I did what I needed to do. And I got up and I looked in the mirror and I saw my first aura. Mine. Nice. And I couldn't figure out why my face was that dark purple. It was like, why? I didn't put purple makeup on last <laughs> night. It was shocking. Yeah. So I washed my face and combed my hair and, and felt better all the time. So I 
decided I was going to go outside. So I held on to furniture and I went over. I got to the back door and my husband spotted me. And he'd heard how people rally before they die. And so he thought, okay, this is it. He ran up and he tried to put me back into bed. And I said, no, I want to go outside. So finally he let me go outside and sit in a, a lawn chair. And I remember wiggling my bare toes in the wet grass. And I just felt so connected mm. with life mm. and so alive. Mm. And, you know, he went called my mother and my sister to tell get them to try to talk me and to go back to bed, and I wouldn't go. And they arrived, and then he decided he was going to go uh, get me something soft to eat. So he went down to the Dairy Queen, and he got me this lovely soft sundae, and that was my favorite, you know. And I picked it up with the spoon that uh, got halfway to my mouth up. I couldn't eat it. Mm. I couldn't get that spoon in my mouth. My my body wouldn't let me get that spoon in my mouth. And I put it back. I said, I can't eat this. He said, well, that's your favorite. I, you know, he tried to make me get, feel guilty because he'd gone all the way down to the Dairy Queen for the, for me. Well, he got for everybody else, too. But I couldn't eat it. And so my body started to really tell me what I could eat and what I couldn't eat. And uh, I experimented th with things that were just mind-blowing because I I would eat a plate of carrots for breakfast that came out of my garden. or uh, I found out I could eat organically grown stuff, but I couldn't eat commercially grown stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I um, found out I couldn't drink dairy products or have anything to do with dairy products or wheat products. And it was years later that I even heard the term celiac. Mm. And, I, and actually, I told my GP that I couldn't eat dairy products and wheat, and he sent me off to a psychiatrist. He said, there's something wrong with your head. He didn't even know what celiac was. <laughs> and, and, I, and I always say that the, that was the most wonderful thing that he ever did for me. Because when I got to the psychiatrist, he started lending me all of his books on psychiatry. <laughs> <laughs> and I was gobbling them up like crazy. We'd have these amazing conversations that he was supposed to be analyzing me or whatever the heck he was supposed to do. But that got me into psychiatry and so all my courses in psychology and it just opened doors. And now, 1971, there weren't any self-help books around. Mm -hmm. So my self-help books were psychology books and and the first book that he gave me was Born to Win by Muriel James and Dorotha Johnward. And books like um, um, I'm Okay, You're Okay. Mm. I mean, that was about all that was around in 71. Yeah. And so my psychiatrist was my first spiritual teacher. That's gorgeous. <laughs> and eventually what happened was he realized that you know, he was just having a good time with me, and he sent a letter back to my GP saying, there's nothing wrong with her head, but whatever she's doing is working with her body, so leave her alone. Gorgeous. And it was wonderful because he had opened this whole vista mm. of human consciousness to me that would never have happened if that doctor hadn't been such an idiot. <laughs> Sorry, did I say that on camera? <laughs> if that nice doctor hadn't sent me to the second <laughs> <laughs> That's classic. I, I, I'm just so grateful for that because it just opened the rest of my life to me. That's and you mentioned you, you first saw the aura on yourself. And from that point, was that the unfoldment of your psychic awareness? Yes. Okay. I mentioned my niece earlier. I'm glad you brought me back to that because that same niece came back like 10 days after. I hadn't seen her for 10 days. And I looked at her and I said, are you pregnant? Mm. Because she was separated at the time.